Hey, good morning, good evening, good afternoon, however you are tuned in, attending, watching, or listening. We are so glad that you could join us. Uh, my name is Aaron, and I'm the pastor here at Grace Church, and we are in our second week of our Be Rich campaign. That is our yearly generosity campaign, where we give and serve and love our community, because we want to make a difference, and we know you want to make a difference. And so together, we can make a difference here in our community uh, in real ways, in tangible ways. And we want to make a difference in the, the lives of other people. We want to make a, a, differ, a difference in your life. And we think that you, living out your faith uh, through giving and serving and loving, is going to make a difference in your life, and it's going to make a difference in someone else's life to show them the love of God. We want to show people the love of God, because that is a difference maker. We want to show people the love of God to everyone because everyone matters to God. We want to show God to people. We want to show God that he loves them even if they don't love them back. And this whole, this whole where well, there's about 100 churches uh, doing Be Rich, and it's all based on this one verse where the, the Apostle Paul tells a young pastor, Timothy, this in 1 Timothy 1, 6, uh, 6, 17. As for the rich in this present age, and that's, that's you. If you're, if you're living in America, that's, I mean, most likely that's you. As for the rich in this present age, charge them not to be haughty or arrogant, nor to set their hopes on the uncertainty of riches, but on God, who richly provides us with everything to enjoy. They are to do good, be rich in good deeds, and to be generous and ready to share. Thus, it says, like for, for the end result of storing up treasure for themselves as a good foundation for the future, so that they may take hold of that which is truly life. So do you want to take hold of that which is truly life? Like, do, you want to, do you want to make a difference? Do you want your life to be different? Well, last week we talked about financial generosity, and that's really important because Jesus talks a lot about financial generosity and your relationship and my relationship with money. And last week we asked for $39.95. That's the average Amazon purchase. We asked for that. We also asked if you could move the decimal over one, great, or two. If you can't afford $39.95, would you move the decimal over one and $3.99? Would you, would you do that in a way uh, that you could give to others? But today we're talking about something maybe more important than money, and for many people more important than money, time, serving specifically, serving. A good friend of mine, he told me the whole mindset has changed with him. He said, this is a guy that, that owned a business, did really well for himself, had money. He said, Aaron, I used, to, I used to write a lot of checks, and I did some good things with those checks. And some did better than others, but I wrote a lot of checks. He said, now in retirement, I'm doing the thing I should have done. Even before I was retired, I'm now investing in when I serve. He said, I still write a lot of checks, but I serve, I get involved, and it's better for me. It makes a difference in my life more. It's better for the people that I serve. It, it makes more of a difference in their life when I'm personally involved, and it's better for the organizations I serve with when I can give both time and money. You see, doing good is pretty commonplace now, but it wasn't always. In fact, it was a pretty radical idea when Jesus came onto the scene. Let's talk about the world in which Jesus arrived. Jesus showed up in this, this little part of the ancient Near East, he was born to very unfamous, you know, working class, uh, poor parents. And he, he, got, he, had, he showed up with some fanfare, but for the majority of his young life, no one knew who he was. But when he started saying things during his ministry, it was revolutionary. 
It was shocking. He said, I mean, he said incredible things like everyone matters to God. It's a big deal. Everyone matters to God. Jesus also would say that the poor are blessed and the meek are blessed and the, the, the people that make peace are blessed and the persecuted people are blessed. Doesn't make sense. He would say that women and children and the disabled and people that are mixed race and people that are from other religions and other ethnicities, they matter to God. In fact, he said, everyone matters to God. And so why was that so revolutionary? That, that's probably very elementary to, to you. But it wasn't 2,000 years ago. And in fact, not that long ago, it wasn't assumed. Like, there were some assumptions. The world in which Jesus entered played by a different set of rules. One was that slavery wasn't practiced. Slavery was assumed. Right? It, wasn't, it was an it was a, it was a, it was a, it was assumption that everyone made, that everyone, everyone had the potential of being owned by someone else. That's not an that's not American invention. That is not a Western civilization. That was the way it is. That's the way it is still in some places. Here in New Mexico, it wasn't a black and white thing. Uh, if, it, was, it was assumed that if you were in the wrong place at the wrong time, someone could snatch you up and enslave you. You see, slavery wasn't practiced. It was assumed. It was a value they had, a value. Everyone had the potential to be someone else's slave, someone else's property. It's very different than today. The world that Jesus showed up into, uh, the gods, the Greek and Roman gods and the gods of, of the day did not love you. They didn't love you. In fact, they didn't even value you. Uh, one, of the, one of the philosophers, the Greek philosopher says, uh, the gods play and we pay. That, that God, the, the, the gods, and there were lots of them, they didn't care about you. They didn't love you. In fact, they really only cared about what they could get out of you. You as an individual, you had no value. Now, now groups had value. People with wealth had value, but as an individual, you had no value. God didn't love you. But not only did God not love you, others didn't. Because there was a pecking order. There was, everyone in the world knew that, that they just, they absolutely knew it to be true that some people were worth more than others because everybody fit in a class Right? You, might, you might know it as a caste system now, that the people at the top were very valuable and they were, they were worth something, and the people at the bottom, they were worth nothing. But everyone had a class. The, the, even the slaves had a, a, a pecking order within theirs. The, the working class had an had a, had a order. Even aristocracy, there were people in the aristocracy more important than others, and that meant worth. It wasn't that you were a person that you had value, that you had worth. It was where you fit and how you fit society. And you weren't really ever going to get out of that. Maybe you could do something really great in a war, and you could, up, you could go up or down a class. You did something really terrible. You could go down a class. You could get stolen by a raiding nation. You would, get down, you would be brought down into slavery. But there was not a lot you could do other than some incredible act. Three, in Galilee, where, where Jesus comes onto the scene, it was a Roman-controlled area. Now, the Romans were pretty, had a, had a huge area of control. And every Roman-controlled area had an uneasy relationship with Rome because Rome was pretty innovative. Up until, up until Rome, I mean, they, they, they made popular the idea of not displacing everybody. 
See, what would used to happen, and it happened to Israel several times in their history, is they, a, a, a foreign nation would come in and they would capture Jerusalem and, and take it over. They would occupy it. Well, immediately they would, they would either kill, most, most of the time they would kill all the top-ranking officials. Everyone else they would ship out. They would ship them to a major metropolitan areas already controlled by them, and then they would put uh, some of their citizens in these ready-made towns as a, as a means to control. They would immediately change the population, change the culture to something they did. Rome was different. They said, oh, it's way more efficient if we don't do that. It's way better that if we take the people that are in charge that we, that we took over, that we, that we captured, and we make them or if they're, not, if they're not willing to play, we make somebody else that was right under them, we make them the head honchos. We're going to make them the head honchos. With the agreement, they have to do two things. First, they have to pay us taxes. They have to pay taxes based on their population. They're going to take a census. That was, they were very good at that. They have to pay us taxes because they're now part of the Roman Empire. Secondly, they had to do whatever it took to maintain peace because Rome said we have an image to maintain that we are a, a nation that is promoting peace. Everywhere we take over, we, we, we seize it with violence, and then immediately there's peace. And so they said you had to do whatever it took to promote peace. And so you have, uh, you know, these leaders that were all about peace, keeping peace no matter what, no matter, no matter how violently they had to keep the peace, they did it. If they, if they didn't keep the peace, Rome would take their status and sometimes their life. Four, Jesus came into a world where the religious leaders of the Jewish faith used the law of God to keep people in their place. Now, this wasn't, this wasn't always, only the default of these Jewish leaders, the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Some of it was they were just carrying out the order of, orders of Rome. Others really used religion like so many use religion as a heavy weight or a burden to put on someone or as a means to control them. And it was no, no different in, Ju- in Jesus' time. Because they also use this to promote other people. And to say, here's who's blessed. It's not all the people that Jesus said had dignity and had, a, had, you know, had good standing and had value. Who was, it, who was it that was the most heavily favored? Well, it was healthy, rich men. In Jesus' world, that he grew up in, that he was placed in. Compassion was weakness. Not only was it weakness, it was worthless. The things that were valued were strength and wealth and your family, like like your extended family and where you came from and your clan and your nation and, and savagery. Savagery was not peace, Savagery was a value. You would take what you wanted by force. That was the value. And then Jesus comes along. And he says these things that are utterly insane to, to the people around him. That they can't, even, they can't even wrap their minds around it. He spoke to people as if all people had dignity. And he said that God loved them no matter where they were, no matter which class they were in, no matter if they were rich or poor, right? no, matter, no matter their health status. He showed that compassion was a true sign of strength and that meek isn't weak. And he said that there's different, you know, we're all different, but God thinks of us in terms of love, that God loves each of us. Right? He was so different than, than what people thought. He, he said, no, no, God, God cares about you. God loves you. You have value to God, even if no one else values you. You can read the Sermon on the Mount, and it was like nothing they had ever heard. Now, we read it now, and we go, yeah, that's, that's really great. We, we, 
reading it now is, we hear, we've heard it. I mean, people will say things in the Sermon on the Mount and maybe not even know they're in the Bible. They definitely won't reference them in the Bible. They'll say things like, treat others how you want to be treated. That's, that's the Bible. That's the words of Jesus. It's commonplace now. That was not commonplace. It was you treat people how they're worth. You treat people how other people expect you to treat those people. But it was, it was shocking. The message of Jesus was unique. It wasn't universal. It, it, was, it, it went against what they knew to be true. No, 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 God doesn't love everyone the same. Look at how people are. I mean, they just, they knew. God doesn't love everybody. Look at how some people live and look at how some people fare in life. No, God can't love everybody. It also goes against what's natural. It goes against what is natural in in you and me. Let me explain. He stunned his audience when he says, in Matthew 5, verse 42, give to the one who begs from you and do not refuse to the one who borrows from you. Well, naturally, what I want to do is say, well, what if they take advantage of me? What if they borrow it and never give it back? What if, they, what if they take what I give them and they waste it? What if they take what I give them and they use it on something that is evil? Jesus doesn't put that caveat in there. He gives a command. Then he goes on to say, you've heard it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. Who does that? That goes against what comes to me naturally, and I'm sure to you too. I mean, who does that? I don't do it. Love your enemies? Not, I mean, it's easy to hate your enemies. That's, what they're, that's why you're, they're your enemies. It's hard to love your enemies. It's hard to pray for those that are persecuting you, unless you're praying for their demise or something, right? But no one does that. Your kids, when they were, when they were so mad at you, right? You, let's, you know, when you, if you have little kids and you take something away, they don't just automatically say, I love you so much and I'm gonna pray for you. No, no, they don't do that at all. They don't do that when they're mad at you. Neither do you, when you're so mad, someone, someone cuts you off in traffic, you don't go, bless you. I'm praying for you right now, unless it's you're praying for their tire to go flat or you're praying for the cop to see them make that stupid move. But that's not what Jesus says. Jesus says to love them and to pray for them. We don't do that naturally. You don't do that during a temper tantrum. You have to be intentional. You have to choose to do that. And he also says in verse 45, so that when you do those things, that you may be the sons of your Father who is in heaven. If you're a child of God, this is how you act. For he makes the sun rise on the evil and the good and sends rain on the just and the unjust. Because what it tells us, it says, do these things... Because God does these things. This is how God operates. He does good for those that appreciate him and love him, but he also does does good for people who can't or won't appreciate him or love him. Look at verse 46 and 47. For if you love only those who love you, what reward do you have? And, and the, the question is rhetorical, and you do have a reward. If you only love those that love you, the reward is you love them and they love you, and it's nice. I mean, that's, that's a nice relationship. <laughs> he says, do not even the tax collectors do the same? And if you greet only your brothers, uh, what more are you doing than others? Even the Gentiles do the same. He uses two categories of people. He uses Gentiles and tax collectors. And whenever you, hear, whenever you read those words of Gentiles, tax collectors, pagans, when you read those words from the, mouth, from the mouth of Jesus, what you've got to do in your mind, what I always do, is you put, is you make a hissing sound. You know, the Gentiles, right? Like, like the, 
the tax collectors. Like, I mean, it's, it's got to be mean. It's got to be nasty. These were the people that were just assumed were evil to their core. And Jesus says, you know what they do? The same thing that you do. They love those who love them. They greet those who they care about. He says, that, so you think about the worst, the worst category of person you can imagine. For some of you, you're thinking about Democrats. For some of you, you're thinking about Republicans. For some of you, you're thinking about Nazi. You're thinking about, I don't know who you're thinking about. But the worst category of people you can imagine, they do this. They love people who love them. They care about people that care for them. They treat others who treat them, they treat others well who treat them well. Jesus says, that's, that's not special. But he says, therefore, you must be perfect as your heavenly father is perfect. He says, listen, if you want to be a son or daughter of God, you can't just do what comes natural. You've got to do what God does. You've got to be perfect just like God is perfect. Now, you say, well, Aaron, perfect? I can't be perfect. Are you kidding me? Perfect? No one's perfect. Only God's perfect. Well, I mean, it tells you that, you, sh- that you know, Jesus is saying you've got to do it. But let's look at what perfect means. Perfect doesn't mean without sin. Perfect doesn't mean that you never make a mistake, nothing ever slips out, or as my old youth pastor used to say, nothing ever sloshes over, you know. That doesn't mean you hit your, you know, hit your hammer, uh, hit your thumb with a hammer, and you, you don't, you know, you just say, oh, shoot, that hurt, golly, right? I mean, it's, that's not, it's not saying you never mess up. That's what the Pharisees tried. It didn't work for them. It's not going to work for you. And I don't think that's what Jesus is telling us. Because it's impossible. You know, see, this, when, when Jesus says this, this is an echo from the Old Testament. And there's a couple of different places that this, that this message comes through. Uh, in Leviticus, Levit- Leviticus 19.2 says, Speak to all the congregation, the, pe- the, the people of Israel, and say to them, You shall be holy, for I, the Lord your God, am holy. Again, I don't think that means Perfect. Now, in God's case, it means he is, he is perfectly holy. It says that you are to be holy. Now, what does holy mean? It means set, a, set apart, consecrated, supernatural, holy with a W, wholly different than everything else. But we also see this in Deuteronomy 18, in, in, in chapter 18, verse 13. It says, you shall be blameless before the Lord. Now, that word blameless is the same word uh, that gets translated into this Greek word that we see in Matthew that Jesus uses. It says, you shall be blameless before the Lord your God. Now, you could also substitute in there, you shall be perfect before the Lord your God. Now, that word can mean perfect or blameless. It can mean without blemish. It was used of animal sacrifices. The the animals that you could take could not have a blemish. They had to be perfect. It could also mean whole or complete or mature. It was used of of, of Job in the Bible. It was used of Job in the Old Testament book, Job. It was said of him by God three times. And even Jesus uses it. Jesus uses it again uh, in, in Matthew 19 and 21 whenever he's talking to the rich young ruler. He says this, if you wish to be perfect or complete, do this, go and sell everything you have, give it all to the poor, and then come follow me. And that's what he says. So he doesn't mean that he's never going to sin again. He doesn't mean that he's, he's never going to make a mistake. He said, if you want to be blameless, if you want to be wholly set apart, consecrated, if you want to do the things that you say you want to do, if you want to be a child of God, then this is what you've got to do. It also can't mean sinless because 1 John 1.18, 1 John 1.8 tells us this, that if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. So I can't say that I have no sin. So clearly Jesus can't be talking about saying having no sin. You see, 
Perfection, what it's talking about here is not being perfect in the sense of never making a mistake, never sinning. What it means is being like God in the sense of doing good for people who can't or won't do good for you. Now, there's a lot of ways that we can't be like God. I'm never gonna be all-knowing or all-powerful. I'm never gonna be omnipresent, like present everywhere all at once at the same time. It's not gonna happen. But I can be like God in this because Jesus tells me I can. Jesus tells me that I am to be perfect like God is perfect in this way, that I do good for people who can't or won't do good for me back. And so what this says is if you want to be perfect, if you want to be mature, if you want to be like God, you need to love people who can't love you back. You need to serve people that can't serve you back. You need to give to people that can't give to you back. You need to, be, you need to do good to people that can't do good to you back. Or maybe, maybe they can't and they just won't. Those are both totally acceptable. You see, Jesus did this everywhere he went. Jesus, Jesus, if you read the gospel accounts, are about his whole life, and you'll see it. He brought dignity where there was none, according to society, but not according to God. He brought love where there was none, but he also brought good deeds where no one thought to do them. He did this through interactions. He, he spoke in public and affirmed dignity in a Samaritan woman uh, at the well who had a horrible reputation in the community. He brought dignity and he did good. He spoke well of the faith of a Roman centurion, an occupier, someone that was actively not allowing the, the Israeli, the, the Jewish religious order to do and to operate how it wanted. He spoke well of that Roman centurion's faith when that Roman centurion asked him to heal his servant. He graced the home, right? He brought dignity and he did good to the homes of Zacchaeus and Matthew, who were both tax collectors. He eventually asked Matthew to, to follow him and be one of his disciples. And Matthew writes this account and he's a tax collector. Remember, you got to say it with a tax collector. Uh, you got to say it mean, Because these people were not considered human. They did not deserve love. They were thieves. They were mob bosses. He healed Peter's mother-in-law. He ate with the the religious elite. And while he's at at dinner with them, a woman comes up with a bad reputation and, and begins to wipe his feet with tears and anoint them with perfume. And if you're still not convinced that he brought dignity and did good for people that couldn't repay him, remember this, that Jesus died for a person like you and a person like me. He died for a sinner like me and a sinner like you. You can never pay him back. You can never come close. But he did that for you and for me. He brought dignity and he brought salvation to me and to you when we did not deserve it. You see, as Christians, we might be criticized by what we, for what we believe. And I think we, in fact, Jesus says we will. He says, you know, rejoice when people, when people persecute you and criticize you and, and put you down for, for the name of Jesus, for believing in what you believe. He says, rejoice and be glad. It's going to happen. But we should also be famous for how we treat others. And we should be famous for how well we treat others. We should know that showing God to everyone, that showing God's love to everyone, that doing good to people is a way that we are like ourselves perfect, like God is perfect that we should be loving people that can't love us back or refuse to, that we should be doing good for people that can never repay us or even if they can, refuse to. We should be well known 
for how well we treat others. And we have this opportunity to do this corporately. We should be doing this in our lives, but we have an opportunity to be doing this corporately at the church. You see, the people should catch us doing good as individuals and part of the church, and that's what Be Rich is about, is the people catching us as a church doing good. And, and I would love to invite you to serve. I asked you to give. Now, if you haven't done that yet, you've got uh, a couple more weeks before we shut that off and it's over and we're, we're not going to ask uh, for the additional giving. Like, that's it's over. The, camp, the giving campaign is over and when it's over, we don't even take donations for it. So get those in. But I'm going to ask you to serve. Would you show love to someone who can't show it back. And that's what Feed New Mexico Kids is about. And that's what Arroyo de, that, the, the program that's running at Arroyo de Oso. Now I need to take one second and correct some information that I misunderstood. Arroyo de Oso has not been a Title I school since the pandemic. They were a Title I school before the pandemic, but they have never seen a need like this. That was my misunderstanding. But I don't, they didn't lie to me, and I didn't lie to you guys. I just, I totally misunderstood what they were saying. They've been a Title I school for a while, but they've never had needs like this. And we have a chance to give and to serve a group of people who can't pay us back, who may never pay us back. But we have a chance to be perfect like our Father in heaven is perfect. And to be a child of God who does for others who don't do in return. You see, Feed New Mexico Kids, we're, we're doing snack bags for 100 kids a week. A week. And these are, uh, the Feed New Mexico Kids is the organization, the organization we do it through. Uh, all of the, the funds that you give to this Be Rich will go to feed kids. 100% of it will go to feed kids these snack packs every week. But I would love for you not just to give, I would love for you to serve. And so I'm inviting you to sign up and to show up and to serve. Now, if you don't live around Albuquerque, if you live in another state or another city, there's still ways for you to serve. It's easy. Go to gracechurchabq.org slash be rich. All one word. Be rich. No spaces, no hyphens. And you'll see. Or you can go on the Grace Church app and you can hit be rich. And there is a place to give, but there's also a place to serve and then feed. And if you would like, if you're in the, if you're in the Albuquerque area, we would love for you to help pack these snack bags. That happens every week. There's lots of times that you can do that. We would love for you to do that. It's a big chore. We need your help for you uh, to come and serve. If you can't do that, if you say none of those times work, or I live out of state or out of the area, we, would, we have other ways. You just click feed and there, there's some instructions on how to do that. Would you be perfect like your heavenly father is perfect? Would you be a son or daughter of your father who is in heaven by loving those who can't or won't love you back? Would you be rich in good deeds by serving? Let's pray. Heavenly father, thank you so much. Father, help us to be perfect like you are. Not in the ways that we can't be, but in the ways that we can, like serving people that don't care about us and don't love us. Father, help us to be rich in good deeds. It's in Jesus' name, amen. Now, check the links above and below, if whatever platform you're on. There are ways to give and ways to serve. Uh, or you can go to the website, gracechurchabq.org slash be rich, or go to the Grace Church app and click be rich. I love you guys. We'll see you next week when we finish up Be Rich Part 3.